Parsons got me on the moon. Jack Parsons got me on the moon. Good evening, good morning, good day, good night, wherever you are, whatever time it is, anywhere in the world. Welcome to the Velocity of Now with me, your host, Thomas Sheridan. I hope you're all keeping well. And we're coming to the end of February, and the weather's been very nice around here lately, and I hope it's been the same where you are, and you're keeping healthy, fit, and you're following your Dharma. Last week's show got a very good response and just now a week later it's had almost 10,000 views which is a lot for the velocity of now I used to be delighted when the velocity of now used to get 2,000 views and now I get 10,000 my vlogs often get 20,000 so thank you for staying part of this conversation and still being here listening to me yapping on about my world view and I was thinking about you know what what is it about people like me and many of you that makes us the way we are the way we are you know i don't really the, the term woke up i don't really know what that means because i know people who are woke who call themselves awake and they they're still trapped into things like religion and christianity and they go down really dopey rabbit holes like the Freeman and the Land thing, or the Flat Earth and all the Terrian nonsense. Uh, they're not awake. Those people are not awake at all. They're just falling into into a cult type mentality, and they have this belief that okay, if if one thing or some things have been sold to us as a lie, then everything must have been sold to us as a lie, and that's not true at all. That's not true at all. And that's a very dangerous and negative way to think. Because then you assume that everything is false. And that's not true at all. Things did happen that you were told about happened. And there's lots of objective proof that you can actually empirically examine with your own eyes. To prove things actually happened. The world doesn't exclusively in exist on the internet and newspapers, magazines and on TV. There's also the reality in front of your own eyes. So, you know, I wouldn't call those people awake. They've just fallen into a cult mentality. Uh, someone who's awake is probably someone who's... Understands that it's really about the destination more than the actual... It's really about the journey more than the, I mean, than the destination. And as a destination, it's like I compared a post this week that someone whose friend is dying of the Rona, not the Rona, the Needlecraft, the Britney Spears concert, and they finally accept it. Why? Because their doctor told them it was probably the Britney Spears, Britney Spears concert that killed you. Now, before the doctor told them that the Britney Spears concert was killing them, 
they didn't believe it. So has that person really advanced? You know, they, the same people that brought them to the Britney Spears con- concert and has now left them basically ready to expire of, of the big C, the TC, they still depend on them to tell them how to live. They can they, they can do, that's, so that's, you know, what is that about? It's a very difficult thing to understand, you know, the NPC normie world, but that's how they are. And why are we not like that, you know? Why, why, why have we escaped that kind of way of thinking? And I was thinking about it the other night, and I was saying to myself, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we we're people who didn't really want to grow up. Now, I don't mean that in an infantile, childish way. We're people who realized at a young age that adulthood was pretty shit. And it was something we really didn't want. And, uh, I mean, I can remember distinctly thinking that. Not that I wanted to make, you know, this whole thing, I want to be a child forever or anything like that. But I just saw, like, all they're doing is, like, it's like that song by Black Sabbath, Killing Themselves to Live. It's like that, you know? And uh, I used to always be amazed. Again, I didn't know about the NPC. I know I went through this last week, but it's, it always bears repeating. I could understand We'd have two people. Oh, you know, me, me and me and me and Sinead are getting married next week. Oh, okay, congratulations! And what sport is? We've been together two years, and we reckon it's time. Now that that's that used to amaze me. That used to amaze me. That it was like, well, we're only getting married because we've embarked on a certain protocol. That means now we get married. You know that kind of thing. And this is before I knew what the, the NPC was and fully understood what the NPC was. But that's what it was. They were just they just filled protocols. And those those of us, we didn't want to grow up to be in that world. We didn't want to be among those types. And we, you know, I know I couldn't understand them at all. I couldn't understand these types who used to follow their father into the same job. I was like, why would you want to do that? You know, like that's why I didn't have much sympathy when I hear about like these like these industries, these coal mines closing down, and they go, "Oh, it's generations of men, father, grandson, father, son, and they've all jobs gone from father to son." I wonder how many of those young men who went down the mines were forced down the mines. They didn't want to be there. I was a miner, and my son will be a miner, and my dad was a miner before me. Like, what? The, what? The, who the hell do you are you to do that? You know, it's like it's like these NPC normie parents who put their children in a soccer jersey the baby the baby's the baby is born and they put it in a soccer jersey of some team you know and they think it's cute like my son is going to support the same club i do it's like what the fuck are you you know and we used to i used to watch this growing up and going these people are just not fit to exist really in many ways uh, because they're just following along what everyone else is doing. And even if they're miserable, they still do it. You know, that kind of thing. And I was never going to put up with that. And I, was, I think that was like, that was what I mean by what I meant. And probably maybe you feel the same way. Is we didn't want, we rejected adulthood. I'm really not surprised that H.P. Lovecraft spent the years of from 18 to 28 basically never leaving the house and it's a really a mysterious part of his life there's not a, there's no biographer out there who can tell you what he did between the ages of 18 and 28 we know that he lived at home with his mother and he didn't he stayed in bed constantly and he didn't go out much at all and uh, he often just lived in a dressing gown and it was a a very peculiar period and people have tried to say it was a nervous breakdown and things like that but I, I think it's when he was studying his occult that's when he was having you know people you know these people say that oh he rejected the occult no he rejected the occult because he knew it worked I mean why is all his stories and letters and all his statements all filled with things about don't try it and then he relays this deep occult information 
Of course he knew about it. His father, Whip, his grandfather Whipple, had like one of the best occult libraries in New England. He was a he was a D top Freemason. You know, it was all there for him to find out. And I think that's what happened. I think he he discovered magic was real. That's what happens. To some people they they try magic, and they try the occult, and it actually it goes real for them, and they either get there. Some of them get very frightened. And, you know, they become really super religious, holy rollers. And others are like, I don't want to talk about it. I'm not going to go, go there. They, these, that's what happens too. And uh, I have more respect for people like that than I want the, things, the, ones who th- the ones who think they're gods. You know, when they're, some working they've done has come to pass. They think they're, like, amazing. But uh, he didn't want any. And I don't blame him. Between, was it 1913... In 1923, he he stayed at home. Probably a good time to stay at home when you consider like World War One and the Spanish flu and all that stuff that was going on. And then when he emerged from that, true, he wrote a satire of a romance novelist, and then he went on to become published and it developed his confidence and he he started making lots of contacts with people and writers. And so he he, he bloomed. And I think that happens lots of many of us too as well, that we may have been kind of, I know, I was very, like, sh- not shy, I was very, uh, what's the word, reclusive, I think, as a kid. Yeah, definitely. And I wouldn't have probably, I didn't even like hanging out with my friends, and I probably wouldn't have unless it was, unless there was kind of social pressures to do it. I would have been perfectly happy sitting in my room all the time, uh, reading and stuff, you know. That would have suited me fine. But... um we look at the world and we say, I don't want to be a part of it. And then there's other people who do noble intentions say, well, I am going to have a family and I'm going to raise my kids so they're not like this. And I have all respect in the world for those people, all respect in the world, because that that's a righteous thing to do. But it's bloody hard. It's bloody hard, especially if you're aware of the stakes that to be played for. You know, you look around, like in the West, how things are deteriorating and... Uh, you you think about it, you know. You like, you know, what my my kid. I mean, I, I I my heart does worry, not worry, but goes out to a lot of those parents who have kids who are young now, and they're thinking like, what is the what is becoming of this world? My attitude would be like, just do your best, and it'll be okay. Just do your best. And I think a lot of those, those parents tend generally do, and think does work out, but it can't be easy. It can't be easy with the pressures in the world. There's a. Uh, Again, it's it's like you go into a kind of an escapism, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. So we escape into things like fantasy, and we escape. I'm not surprised cosplay is so big today, with so many people wanting to escape the, the, the reality of the world. This is the first time in history that people have probably in the West anyway seen no future. It's really bizarre. I mean, I saw a meme the other day, and it said like. Uh, Atheism prom- promised a, a scientific future of perfection and it's produced nothing but despondency and suicide around the West and people have nothing to live for. There's a lot of truth to that because you need a spiritual foundation in order to grow not only as a people but also as a nation. And when I mean when I say spiritual foundation, I'm talking about religion. I'm talking about a spiritual foundation. There are even atheistic societies like the Soviet Union had a spiritual foundation to that nation based on the concept of Mother Russia that really only they could understand and we, we got glimpses of that we got glimpses of that uh, spiritual you know foundation through things like their patriotism and their Slavic mind being very different in that way but there was still a spirit even though the communists the Bolsheviks told them there was no such thing as God they still had a deeply held spiritual foundation because it transcends any religious doctrine. It's fundamentally rooted in natural law, but it's very heavily applied towards culture and the landscape. It's, it's actually one of the things that proves that like paganism is the proper religion, because you, you, don't, you don't see many things in the Quran about how to love the landscape. You don't see much about in the Bible about it, because these, come from the, these places come from barren lands of sand and goat and lizards and snakes. So, like, where the European concept is the concept of the beauty of the European landscape, the majesty of the tall mountains, 
the you know the endless forest the you know the the beautiful oceans and by extension that was and coastlines and by extension that was extended towards north america and the, the america and how north americans not just americans but canadians and mexicans how they saw their land in the same kind of epic way and that was that came out of european paganism that came out of you know classical paganism and i was talking to someone there the other day online about you know my belief that christianity absolutely destroyed the west destroyed it and we have been in a death spiral in the west ever since the likes of saint augustine and or you know origin of angazandria and the compiling of the you know the, the bible as we know it, and the beginning of canon law and so on and it's been a downward trajectory and I was talking about some guy who who claims that if it wasn't for Christianity, it would have never it would have never civilized the Germans. They'd be still barbarians living in the woods hunting pigs. And the thing is that we don't know really how the ancient how the ancient Germanic tribes actually lived and functioned because we're we're only given two versions of propaganda: war propaganda from the Romans. And uh, then later Christian propaganda from the Christianized Romans, and the same thing in Ireland. You have the this whole notion that like before Saint Patrick arrived, or Christianity arrived, this was a this was a brutal, vicious land, of you know ignorant cavemen basically, and yet we're supposed to believe that when a, a year or two of Christianity arriving. All this glorious ironwork and silverwork and and all this Celtic design artwork that's in the Muse National Museum of Ireland, and all the bronze work that goes back thousands of years even before that, and things like the round towers that all, they all magically appeared at the same time. As Saint Patrick, and that's what they're telling us. No, those things were already here. You know this this whole thing that Christianity creates a a better moral framework. Well, in Ireland, Christianity has led to nothing but bloodshed. Nothing but bloodshed. I mean, even before the Reformation and then what led to sectarian wars. I mean, remember that the Confederacy Wars in this country led to the death of one third of the population. And that was over different versions of the Bible. The King James versus the, the Roman Canon Law Bible. You think about that. If Christianity never arrived in Ireland, those people would have never died. And that even before that, if you go back to the mid, they, they love to talk about the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages in Ireland was a time of Christianity and absolute brutality. These uh, interwarring clans were killing each other and attacking each other with a viciousness that would, did not appear in Ireland until Christianity arrived. In fact, when Christianity arrived in Ireland, what it produced was the number one economy, slavery. And this is why the local Irish chieftains who were slaughtering each other under the Prince of Peace all around the country were perfectly happy to sell to sell slaves to the Vikings to take advantage of their maritime infrastructure and the Vikings would have been pagans Nordic pagans and they would have been just like taking the slaves and bringing them off and selling them or whatever but the, the, you know the, the, it's just astounding astounding uh, the brutality of Abrahamism, when it arrives into a place, it just causes mayhem. Of course there were wars before before the Bible. Of course there were. But I can find, in all the years I've been looking, I can not find a single proof anywhere of a religious war fought. There were fought, laws fought over succession, over royal f titles. There were wars fought over land, resources, you name it. But I can find no evidence. At nothing in antiquity where a war was fought over religion it just didn't exist until the Abrahamics came along now I may be wrong there may be something out there I can't find it all I just can't and there was no and this is when the Christians say well when you know Jesus died it ended all sacrifice what was the Crusades Crusades were human sacrifice they were human sacrifice to the to, to Christianity to the, to the Bible to the scriptures the as soon as they got organised, the Albigensian Crusade, one and a half million Cathars exterminated, and they were Christians. As before, you even get into the, you know, the Crusades in the Middle East and the, 
you know, the, the, the three Swedish crusades to, to exterminate the last of the pagan kingdoms in Eastern Europe, in Karelia and East Russia. And then these people say, oh, well, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't have sacrifice, only a pagan sacrifice. See, the pagans are honest about it. That's the difference. Honest. So, you kind of, this is what's the whole thing I was saying about going along to get along. This is the same thing. It's like, oh, I'm going to go off on a crusade and I'm going to kill Arabs. I'm going to go off on a crusade and kill, you know, Saracens and Jews in the Middle East. Oh, I'm going to go off on a crusade and I'm going to kill pagans in Prussia and Karelia. And why are you doing that? Well, everyone was doing it. That kind of thing. And that's exactly what it's like. There's that... That that documentary film made by Peter Jackson, They Will Not Grow Old, was a hell of an eye-opener for me. Oh, well, it was the spirit of the age. Everyone was going off the fight, and we thought it would be a great adventure. Hold on a second. You, do you understand? Do you even know what war is? You think it's going to be a great adventure? Do you even know what war... Well, all I had to do is that there hadn't been any great wars since Napoleonic Wars ended. So people have forgotten just how incredibly brutal wars had been the French and the the Germans didn't because they fought the Franco-Prussian war but the British definitely had they hadn't fought in any real massive wars since the Napoleonic era there was a good 60-70 years of relative peace by their standards I don't, how can I say going off the fight in a war is an adventure well everyone's doing you know that, that song pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile Boy, smile. What's the use in worrying? It never was worthwhile. And they're like they're singing. And if you see so many videos of them marching off to the Somme, they all have this gormless look on their face. And if half of you say, half of you is thinking to yourself, "Poor innocent bastards had no idea what they're facing," but they were trained to use a gun, and the gun, the gun for the bullets. And yet the NPC mind is incapable of understanding that the German fucker on the other side of the field, he has the same gun and he's been saying as far back at you. They don't seem to be able to understand that. And you see that, this, we saw that all during the Rona and everything, that you cannot reach so many of them because they're not capable of that kind of level of thought that level of introspection this is why you know this whole thing well why are you catholic when well, my dad was a my parents were catholic and my grandparents were catholic okay you, you've made no introspection like i had to deal with one muppet last week and he said to me uh paganism won't give our the moral frame framework and then goes uh, i'm sticking by the lord Bra. And when I pointed out to him, you do understand that Eregopra means, you know, the uh, to salute the goddess, er, the pagan goddess Eru. And he's like, well, so what? Well, you just, so what? You just proved you're a stupid fuck. That's what so what? That's what so what? And he even said, and my kids, are, my, me and my kids are going to be Christians. Oh, so you're deciding for them. Let me tell you something. How come it's okay for someone to decide that a child is going to be a Christian, a Jew, or a Muslim without asking the kid's permission and then it's somehow wrong for them to decide what their gender is going to be? I've got news for you. It's all the same thing. A parent has no right to impose their religion on their child. They could just say to me, you can be whatever you want. It's up to you. If You are nothing. It's the same thing. The hypocrisy on both sides there. It's, it's amazing how many normies and NPCs have children that they raise for the, that purpose that that purpose for the purpose of being miniature versions of themselves and often they will raise them knowing their own lives have been shit so they're raising them as a minister a miniature version of their own shit lives I had a very difficult night the other night um, lots of nightmares Nightmares involving these UFOs that were basically causing people to murder other people without consequence. And 
the ones who were murdered in the nightmares they went into a reality where things were kinder and more fair and I was trying to get into that reality but the UFOs in the sky which were shaped kind of like cornucopias they were shaped like that like a horn made up of different segments disappearing like a like kind of if, a, if you looked at a worm or a tube vanishing into a vanishing point not you flat air because you don't know what vanishing points are but it, it, within regular geometry a vanishing point and I woke up feeling awfully out of sorts it was one of those days where you know reality has felt flat, fractured for a long time a long time but it was one of those days I woke up where uh, the monumental fracture the complete irrationality and just unsettling strangeness of the world today really really came home to me it was really profoundly almost toxic feeling to the point where it was very difficult to even look at life as anything other than a bad dream at the moment and you know I was talking to somebody about this and they were bringing up things like CERN and the Hadron Collider and the Mandela effect and if it had in fact destroyed reality and I don't know I just don't know what the answer is you know and it seems that like at this stage of the game as the world becomes more surrealist and fract reality seems more and more fractured it's difficult to know what reality is or what you can compare it to uh, like I was looking at the the monuments at Baalbek in the Lebanon the what they call now the Temple of Bakus and it's obvious that the Romans built upon a pre-existing structure because the Romans wouldn't have had the technology and either did the Greeks or the Etruscans to move those lintels from the quarry the size of them to the site and then install them in the walls off the ground using their you know lifting cranes and ropes across rough ground too and people were saying what do you think caused it was you know the gravity less I don't know was there some kind of sound effect used I don't know did they have high technology using elect electronic electrical conductors I honestly don't know were there giants I don't know I just don't know it, but all I know is that when you look at Baalbek and you see the size of those lintels you immediately are hit by okay the reality that we live in now and experience now probably wasn't always the case because there was a different kind of reality in the ancient world that gave people the ability to move colossal sizes of stone lift them off the ground and to insert them in impossible places and angles that we don't have the machines to do that today so if you forget about all the concepts of a technology involved in that what if we're looking at when we look at the foundations of the temple of Bakus in Baalbek what if we are looking at fragments of another reality you know like the stone balls in Scotland that they find the stone spheres with all those bizarre intricate designs on them made in the Neolithic allegedly so five and a half thousand years ago we're looking at, at something from another reality not just from another time not just from a lost aeon or a lost technology but something from another reality and I was wondering when those realities like Malta is a good place to experience this when those realities were shifting from 
the reality of, say, that could build places like Baalbek or Petra and, you know, the Great Pyramids at Giza. At that time, did it feel like it feels to us now? And you do wonder when people say things in the future like, did you know that back in the 20th century, people launched rockets into space and they landed men on the moon and they sent probes out as far as beyond out to the Oort cloud past Pluto and photographed all the outer planets in incredible detail and then people say but how did they do it and they were going we just don't know we just don't know because they'll have a whole other version of re scientific reality that can't comprehend it. And I often wonder if these flat earthers and people like that are the beginning of this, this reality change where the previous paradigm no longer can be comprehended by them. Because you, you can take a flat earther to these, you know, and you can explain to them that north doesn't mean up. You know, things like that. You can explain to a flat earther that, you know, if you, uh, pouring water on a football is not the same thing as pouring water on a, uh, the water sitting on a planet. You can show them that water bends in spheres and they'll say it doesn't bend. You can't, like, there's, there's like, there's something switched off in them. And again, I'm wondering, and you see that with the, t the extension of the Tartarian people, that, the, are these the ones who have already forgotten where we came from you know are these the ones who have already forgotten the technology of the 20th century that brought us to the 20th century and this is the new reality and in the same way we can't figure out how they installed these enormous lintels at places like Baalbek and Petra if we were to go back then, they'd say, well, they did it like this, of course, it's basic engineering. But we are in a position now in this reality where we can't grasp or understand or comprehend <laughs> what they considered basic engineering. And it seems to be the same thing is happening again now, where more and more people are unable to grasp the technology of the 20th century, where it's well, how could they have done it? Well, they used basic physics and rocketry. Well, how there was no big hard computers. They didn't need it. You can get to the moon and back with a slide rule and a piece of paper and a pen. They didn't save the telemetry. It doesn't matter. Telemetry is only relevant to a specific mission. There's no use to the next one. You know, you just can't reach them. You, no matter how many answers. The, how did you get the moon buggy inside the, inside the landing module? They didn't. It was strapped to the outside, folded up. Uh, how did the LEM fly to the moon and back? It didn't. It went as cargo inside a container, inside a gigantic rocket. You just can't make them see anything. You give them the answers and you get a laughing emoji or they ignore you. And it's the same with so much of the, we the technology. They, w people today can't comprehend how something like the Hoover Dam was built or the, the dam at Niagara Falls or the, the vast di dam systems across Russia. They can't comprehend this. And so they're already falling into a world where, gee, how did they do that? And is this, you know, let's now discuss what made that fracture happen. Did that fracture happen as a messing with technology, like of the parable we're given of Atlantis all the time, that they, you know, that the, you know, use the Tolkien analogy, the dwarves dug too deeply and unleashed a balrog. I know I always keep going back to Lovecraft, but the story, the horror at Red Hook, uh, the whole thing of that seems to have that energy about it. That here was this guy, Tom, the detective Thomas Malone, is aware of these depraved cults that are involved in human sacrifice and everything in, in Red Hook in Brooklyn. And he eventually busts them all open and through like his, you know, and it's just, as he says, the Celts far vintage vision. Uh, even though he was an educated college man, he had that Celtic thing of seeing the the mystical. And that gave him an advantage in dealing with this supernatural cult in Brooklyn. 
and when he's defeated the cult leader the newspapers report that he died and like a peaceful old man and he was just a little eccentric who was involved in harmless magical and alchemy and chemical practices as a hobby when he was involved in things like tunnels involving sex slaves and human sacrifice and everything else and it was all based around the concept of illegal immig- or of you know mass immigration of mixing different races this is what people talk about you know Lovecraft being a bigot but what he was really talking about is the the it was another version of the Tower of Babel that when you have so many people together that are different you don't get diversity in terms of making life better for everyone you create mass confusion and depravity and it's all based upon these tunnels and underground canals underneath Red Hook where all these ships are filled that all these boats come in with like you know smuggled in immigrants for slavery and for human sacrifice and for different kinds of uh, archaic foreign rituals dark rituals and at the end when it's all over Malone discovers that somebody's been opening up the canals again, digging the streets, and these strange faces are on the, are on the, uh, can be seen walking around again. So it was a constant battle, and he just didn't end it. He just ended one phase of it, and that's how reality seems. It seems like w- one phase ends, but I, 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 you know, when you look at the horror red cook right now, I'm feeling that sensation that Detective Thomas Malone had that it's like we've come so far and now it's all falling apart it's changing now you could say things like well this has been caused by CERN it's been caused by you know the the internet the world wide web social media something's happened the Hadron Colliders and all that stuff it tor- was torn on did things I mean I'm open to everything I just don't know that's the whole thing like the big stones when they move I just don't know but I do know that a reality once existed that made that possible. And now that reality does not exist and it's impossible. Using the framework of how it was done in the past. And it seems to be happening now today that people are forgetting about engineering. The combustion engine. The generation of electricity. You know, the the things like power stations, hydroelectric, the rocketry. It all seems to be getting forgotten again. And people you know when you have a situation where you have truthers saying things like airplanes don't have any f- fuel in them these aircrafts don't ha- don't have enough room in the fl- to fill to get the fuel in i mean it's just this is the, this is this is a this is an insight into a reality that's melting that's dissolving before our eyes but i'm try- but and this is why i think right now especially i manage well most days but right now i have this strange sense Maybe because of those bad dreams I had that night of the UFOs destroying reality. And it could be something like that, you know. Like, in fact, if I was to throw, if I was I had no choice and I was in the, in, you know, Las Vegas and a casino in front of me. And they said, here's all the options for what's going on. But you have to vote on one. You can't walk away from the table. You know, what, what do you bet on the house? And I would say... I would bet on it being interdimensional non-human beings controlling human beings on this earth like gods and not all of us can be controlled and the ones that can't be controlled are the only ones that can see what's really going on I don't like to bring current events or politics into the VONs because this is basically a spiritual occultic broadcast but sometimes you have no choice when the demon world impacts upon you know our mortal world and last night in Vienna in two separate instances we had four women and a girl stabbed to death to join the myriad of gin attacks that are happening or have happened in not just Vienna in Brussels and London and Strasbourg and Manchester and all over the north of England and Dublin and Sligo Strasbourg everywhere everywhere the the gin infected arrive this is what happens now this brings up another issue that make me think of this 
is that I had an argument online. When I say argument, I mean a cordial, as cordial as, as I can be, with a well-known ghost hunter. You know, these people who go into so-called haunted places and go, you know, looking for departed souls. And this person, who's a well-known ghost hunter, was posting that things, things like... Well, while he is a ghost hunter who go, who hunts the the spirits of the departed, and I've not and I've encountered this several times, including one near hostile reaction to a TV ghost hunter I spoke to in Houston, in Texas a few years ago. And that is that these people say that demons and demonic entities and possession is all rubbish. So on one hand, they're willing to accept the concept that human souls following death can hang around on this mortal plane and be spoken to and contacted with and even seen and photographed. But they think the idea of demons, non-human entities, you know, whatever you want to call them, fairies, skinwalkers, the law, they're... They're not, they're rubbish, they're fairy tales. There's no truth to it. And they certainly can't possess people. Now, I'm absolutely convinced at this point that many of these ghost hunters themselves are possessed. And they're being told to say this. They've gone into like old abandoned hospitals or old abandoned, you know, places or buildings. And they've encountered what is an entity living there, a demon, but more increasingly the jinn. The jinn is much more. It's increasingly prevalent, particularly in the West, particularly in Europe, because of all the diversity. And these uh, these entities have convinced these people that they don't exist while feeding off their nervous system. So, you know, like the average person with a Ouija board who's talks, or doing ghost hunting and think they're talking to, like, you know, Richard the Third or whatever... That's an entity telling them what they want to hear so they can feed off the charge from their the output of their nervous system when they become a heightened state or excited or even frightened. This is why they, when they're running in these ghost hunter stupid TV shows and screaming, that release of energy is being deliberately triggered by the demons that are inside them, telling them to release this energy so they can harvest it. So, you know, so it's the output of their nervous system or their neurochemical charge from this, uh, the, the, these states of excitement and hysteria. And this is why, if you ever go on a ghost hunt, as soon as people start howling and screaming and running around, you know they're possessed by demons and there isn't a ghost anywhere to be seen. Now, I don't discount the fact that there are ghosts that do hang around on this mortal plane, as rare as it is. And when a human does die, they do spend a small amount of time here uh, in Bardo before they move on to their next stage whether reincarnation or into some other kind of light being uh, but they, that that's it they're gone you're not going to get your Aunt Mary 20 years later on, an, on a Ouija board you know or a seance you're going to get the entities they'll tell you who tell you anything you want and they'll they'll make you believe it and an, an Ouija board when it's a Ouija board sorry when it's open it's like a it's like a, a you know the bat signal the Batman signal for, for low level entities and they swarm in from everywhere to tell you what you want to hear and time and time again I encounter these ghost these ghost hunters who say demons what a load of rubbish and then they re do reports on going to some kind of like you know Bradshaw manners and, and having claimed to have encountered the ghost of Lady Lady Bradshaw de la Mere you know this kind of thing it, the, but they, they, they're so dismissive what a load of rubbish that's what the kind of things they say it's nonsense you know you, you, they, they allow you some they, they're, they're allowed their paranormal stuff but you're not allowed yours now the reason for this is quite simple the vast majority of these ghost hunters are car crash occult morons who have no esoteric or spiritual training to even remotely comprehend what they're dealing with. So they basically see movies like, you know, Poltergeist, Ghostbusters, The Others, and think it's all ghosts from the departed, that they have to, they have to help move them on to the other side. 
and uh, it's it, 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 it the, the arrogance of these types is quite remarkable it's staggering you, if they were complete you know rational atheists and didn't believe in any paranormal you could understand their you know dismissive that's bullshit kind of mentality but they 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 actually have a certain level of paranormal you know belief but it's only their one's the one that matters they bring a kind of a christian abrahamic mentality into it is that only my version of god is real only my version of the paranormal is real you see this with the ufo crowd you know the, the space aliens crowd you know like it's only space aliens that are real and any other interpretation of the fact well now they're starting to begrudgingly accept it but m only because most of them are christians but you know when people like Jacques Villet and and Rosemary Ellen Guiley were were talking about how you know these things are not spacemen and mechanical crafts they're something else and of course John Keel being the, the granddaddy of them all uh, they these people met with unbelievable hostility in John John Keel's book Our Demon Haunted Planet which is a kind of a bunch of essays he he, he actually calls the people in the UFO circles you know cultists they're, they're members of a cult and again you wonder if they're also these types were also possessed by these entities and were arrogantly arrogantly going on about if they weren't saying this, it's all rubbish there's no such thing as you know strange lights in the sky the ones who said little green men and all this stuff and laugh you know oh was Elvis on the spaceship both them and the ones who go it's only aliens from Alpha Centauri it's Pleiad Pleiadians were they all possessed by the same entities behind these strange lights in the skies or strange missing time experiences? You know, I'm just looking at the, the the woodland at the back of my house. I have a fucking awesome backyard. It's just looking at the the, the ivy covered trees leading across the bogland. My God, it's 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 straight out of hauntology. I know it's only this time of year you can really appreciate it because the leaves haven't hit the trees yet, and the bog is all brown and. The trees are all covered in ivy and there's no leaves on them. Anyway, I digress. I just, I, I stare across that bog while I'm doing this broadcast. But, um, this is what they're like. This is, this is what you're dealing with. Back to Lovecraft again. The, the horror Red Hook, that, that's really describing the world we're living in today. Lovecraft's alleged racism... Uh, which is real, you know, he was racist, he, he definitely was like a, you know, but he was a man of his time, but he was also not talking rubbish. He was aware that th these, when you have large numbers of, you know, <laughs> what, what people from the East, shall we say, from the darkened lands, the swarthy types, as he would have kind of called them, uh, this the Italo-Semitic Mongoloids, the names he used for them, uh, I don't think he meant like Italian people as such. I mean, I mean people from that part of the world, from sort of like Sicily East, that they're bringing with them their their supernatural entities, and the story, the horror at Red Hook, is really about that. Remember Thomas Malone? I mean, people said that Lovecraft was anti Irish. He wasn't. He was anti Sinn Fein. He was right. Though. When you look at Sinn Fein now, he was right. You know, but he, he didn't. You know, it, one of his English, one of his, you know, his. English uh, story writing tutors was an Irish guy and it's one of the biographies he said that Lovecraft was he used to annoy him because he was constantly making reference to, about the paddies and mix and this kind of thing and then he would turn around and say no I'm not really talking about all Irish people I'm talking about like these Sinn Feiner types these Fenians and he goes they're, they're, they're all devoted to the Pope but it was the Pope who gave Ireland to the King of England and that's true. So Lovecraft wasn't lying. And here they are all devoted to the papacy that gave their country away to to the English. And he, he, that, isn't that the truth? How can you argue with that? This is why to this day I don't understand why Irish people are Catholics. Or even Christians at all. But anyway, Lovecraft in the heart of Red Hook, well, that's the story he was giving. That these people, the, you know, Thomas Malone, he was like a, a university educated Dublin man, he describes him as who had the Celts far vision but was capable uh, he wanted a decent society a decent Brooklyn in the same way people on our tribe want the decent country that you live in and you're aware that this this shift in society is 
is is a spiritual part of it. It's just a spiritual, and these people in their droves bring new spiritual things with them that are often hostile to our spiritual concepts. Now, this is going to piss off people, but I don't care. This is what it's the truth. There are their spiritual entities and archetypes will go to war against ours. You know they will, and. Uh, and as a result, we kind of lose our protection. And that's what the, the horror at Red Hook is really about. And Thomas Malone is trying to maintain a spiritual, a psycho-spiritual, cultural, economic sense of well-being within Brooklyn, in Red, the Red Hook. But you have the high polloi of Flatbush, the upper class, flooding Red, Bro- Red Hook with all these people that are carrying their gins and their demons and their their, their their dark spiritual entities inside them and turning Red Hook into a depraved place of human sacrifice, child trafficking and so all kinds of underground activities. Does that remind you of anything? Is it any wonder why I call Lovecraft the prophet, a seer? I call him the seer of providence. And, of course, you have this political woke culture. You'll say, oh, love, it's unfortunate Lovecraft felt that way. No, it wasn't. I, I consider it highly fortunate. He wasn't, per se, attacking these people. He was saying they carry with them, just like the, in the Call of Cthulhu, the, the voodoo cults the, down in, in Louisiana, they carry with them spiritual forces that we as Westerners are not able to prepare and deal with. And as a result, these same spiritual forces inhabit the ones on our side, the Wokies and the politically correct and the politicians, uh, to do nothing about it. I'll give you an example. Right, so we had this horrific attack in Vienna last night. And what what would a Wokie, a lefty or a liberal say to that? Sincerely, and they would say it's they say it's it's sad, but it's a small price to pay for all these great ethnic food trucks we have. That's that that's demonic. Sorry, that is a demon that you're hearing speak that's saying that. And I'll tell you why it's a demon. The ultimate impulse within humanity is to save the women and children first. And this is not necessarily because of, you know, the classic story of the Birkenhead drill. The HMS Birkenhead, it was a ship that was carrying immigrants from Ireland, Scotland and Scotland to South Africa just in the 1850s. And it it hit some rocks and the men on the ship all gave up their lives and uh, to get as many women as possible saved. And they weren't just Irish and Scottish, they were English as well. Uh, and Dutch and South African and stuff like Flemish and the you know Afrikaners, uh, what was to become Afrikaners, and they they gave up their lives so the women and children would say be saved, and that's what they call the Birkenhead drill, that the the men shouted say women and children first, and that became a standard, that actually came from the Scottish and Irish immigrants on the boat, and that came directly from the clan systems, in the clan system whether the clans were having a, a war amongst themselves, or attacked by vikings or anglo-saxons or whatever the thing was to save the women and children first because obviously that makes sense of the women being the 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 wombs of the next generation and as are the children the the boys will grow up to be the men so this is why you know one of the things that makes abrahamism an apostate to European thinking is that when the Abrahamics conquered all through the Old Testament they they openly boast about killing the children and women this is what they do or it's taking them as slaves uh, but the, it was a kind of a thing in ancient European and not just European all through in the European world to let the women and children survive uh, and to because that, that was considered almost honorable and you'd be pretty depraved like King Herod in the Bible to go after all the babies. So that's where, that's where the Birkenhead drill came from. The clan cultures among the Irish and Scottish poor bastards who died off the coast of South Africa shouting women and children first. Now, you know that a society is under demonic control when it's not women and children first. So therefore, when you have four women and a girl, 
stabbed by vibrancy and culture last night by great food trucks in Vienna last night, you know that's demonic because these individuals would consider their their multi ethnic delusion and great food trucks more important than women and children. You have demonic control. This is why you had Feridun, the king of Rohan, at Helm's Deep. When it looked like there was no chance, he moved the women and children deep into the mountain to keep them alive because that was that was Rohan's future. He had to keep the women. His his primary purpose of the, as, as the king of Rohan, Verin, was to, at any cost, even if all the men died and the teenage boys died, that all the women and children had to survive. It was the only chance that Rohan had. And of course you had the, you know, the thing of his son dying prior to that, you know, in, in showing how important this is of keeping the next generation safe. The You know, this is what the whole thing in, within this Nordic paganism and all this fucking cosplay shit of shield maidens is such a load of crap. The, the Vikings would have never put their women into battle. Never. They, they needed those wombs to produce babies. And the shield maiden would have would have done things like, uh, and it's and it's 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 in the Irish annals that like things like the the Battle of uh, Clontarf, that the Vikings and the the women in the in the baggage party, the shield maidens, their job was to patch up the wounded and the men and send them back if they had a big cut, to put a, a bandage on it and send them back out to battle if they could go back out to battle, that was the point of that. That was the point of that. So this whole thing of shield mate, women on the front like getting these, these stupid TV shows like uh, Vikings, that would never happen in real life. That would be considered the most depraved, barbaric, demonic thing to do would be to put, put, a, put a sword in your woman's hand and send it to the front line. You now, of course, there were women who did fight in battle, but it wouldn't have been encouraged. They would have also, would be, there would have been women like in positions of power like, you know, Grania Suela here in Ireland or, you know, Boudicca, Bud Bodicea in England. Well, what was what was to become England, Britain, and so on, but otherwise the women didn't do that. So when you don't protect the women and children in your society, and you you think it's it's it should come secondary to great food trucks, you're under demonic control, and exactly what Lovecraft was warning us about in this. That's why I have no problem when people say to me, "Wasn't Lovecraft the real racist?" And I go, "Yeah, but he was a man of his time, and that's how he saw the world." Well, are you not bothered by that? Not in the fucking least. Not in the least. Uh, because it's 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 reality, and I don't live in a fantasy world. Because the further you sink into the... This is why you have grown men today who are playing video games all, to, all the time. And won't, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really trying not to get political here, but I'll just say one more thing. This is a message to the men of the north of England. The grooming gangs have actually gotten worse. The police is doing nothing about it. Why are you still going to Ali or Muhammad in the corner shop and the kebab house and giving them your money? That's all I'm saying. We're tribal by nature. We doesn't mean we have to hate each other. We can live in peace. We can cohabitate in peace. But as soon as your tribe is being attacked by another tribe... Your job is to defend your women and children first. And if you don't do that, you're involved in the wrong side of spiritual battles and spiritual history. I always return to the uh, to the mythologies, to the great stories, to the uh, the the hero's journeys and the archetypes and you've and within them I find the wisdom that helps me rationalize what at times seems to be the the you know unrationable if there's such a word and you've often heard about me talking about the concept of of the themes behind Fraser's the golden bell and a running theme throughout the Golden Bell is the the theme of slaughtering the king, and it's part of the European mythology 
right up to the present, well, not to the present, because that's one of the problems. We, we, uh, we have forgotten that our leaders are mortal and they are subject to being struck, struck down when they profane us. And this is why you have this arrogance in places like Davos, where they sit around, because they've made us as Europeans forget this. In the Golden Bell, Sir James Fraser, he actually said the purpose of the book was to explain the remarkable rule which regulated the succession to the priesthood of Diana Ararcia. To illuminate the obscure and apparently trifling local custom, Fraser wrote 12 volumes in a series of books just to describe, just think about that. He used, he used in the late Victorian age, Fraser wrote 12 volumes, okay? And the, these 12 volumes were filled with enormous amounts of comparative myth mythological and uh, folklore material with the primary purpose of explaining uh, this one event within that took it, it surrounding the priest of, of Diana Artemis as that's how significant he saw it the the golden bell itself it begins with this description of the sacred groves of of Diana at Arisia Arisia Aresia, sorry, Aresia. And that's near the Lake of Nemai in the Alban Hills, just to the south of Rome. And let me get the golden bell. He, he says in the golden bell here at the beginning, In this sacred grove there grew a certain tree, round which at any time of the day, and probably far into the night, a grim figure might be seen on the prowl. In his hand he carried a drawn sword, and he kept peering warily about him, as if at every instant he expected to be set upon by the enemy. He was a priest and a murderer, and the man for whom he looked was sooner or later to murder him and hold the priesthood in his stead. Such was the rule of the sanctuary. A candidate for the priesthood could only succeed to office by slaying of the priest, and having slain him, he retained the office till he himself was slain by a stronger or craftier usurper. Now just think about that. You, you know, accolades, it was, a, it was the true meritocracy. Accolades were based on not who, what money family you came from. What else is the George Soros' son to see how that's all worked out, a Prince Charles. Now the priest who slew the slayer himself should be slain natural order of things and he was called the rex nemenoris the king of the wood now no one was allowed to cut a branch of the sacred tree round which he prowled except a runaway slave who could break off the bow the golden bow that the books the series of books is related to and challenge the priest to combat this custom continued until the second century a.d now, what happened in the 2nd century AD, guys? Oh, was that the last video when I told you all about the rights of Eleusium and why that was banned and who banned it? That's where it all began. This is why I, this is why I have such a problem with Christianity. From the starting point, we ha because of Christianity, we have a simpleton like George Soros' son wielding unimaginable power in this world today. And it was from that point that Fraser examined similar customs and rituals from all over the world. He provided fuel for all kinds of arguments and have gone on ever since. I mean, he is the one who gave birth to the Campbells and the Youngs in terms of this stuff. But the part of his work which has aroused the greatest interest has always been that of the killing of the secret king, the killing of the god king, the king for a day. You remember my book, The Amble of the Psyche, which you can read for free on Substack, on my Substack? I spoke about that there, the killing of the king, either through a you know a symbolic or a literal actual battle. Now this rule of succession of kingship of the wood was definitely connected to some constant earlier idea of the grove and the veneration of the woodland. So we're in the druids and all this kind of thing. 
And there was also the Oak Men of Dunner, which I also think I covered in one of I think I had a quarter of it in the in the Druid Code or in the in the Ambulus the Psyche that they, there was actual there was actually sacred priests who existed in the Germanic world whose job was to take care of the oak trees. And if you cut the the bark off an oak tree and were caught, you were you would have your entrails you disemboweled and you will be tied around the oak tree where you cut the bark off to die in order to feed your life force back into the oak tree and this was all basically done according to rites surrounding Dunar or Thor or, or Thunar in the Germanic tradition so what was Diana in terms of, of that in the woodlands and the groves of the Hellenic, Hellenic and in a Latin world, you had the, you had Dunar or Thor, and the whole things of the Immersol and all that kind of thing within the, the Germanic pagan world. They're up, they're the same everywhere. Now the the Rex Nemonorisus, not Nem Nemo Renus, sorry Nemorenus. I can never pronounce that one. The king, the, the woodland king, I'll just call him was a human incarnation of a tree god and who remained ever vigorous and virile because in his human form he was never allowed to grow weak or old the trees don't die uh, and you know they they die well i mean they don't die i mean when, when the winter comes along they go into hibernation and come back to life the priest king who aged or fell ill or relaxed in his vigilance would be killed of course and replaced by a stronger one it's easy it's also easy to see why a runaway slave was the only person considered likely to covet so dangerous an office because they'd nothing to lose this is the whole thing of like the the, the reign of the fool king now fraser found the same theme behind many medieval and modern european spring and harvest customs he found that in africa and uh, the white nile the the gods of the White Nile starved their king to death when he showed signs of old age of disease and that it also allowed any king's son to attack him and fight him to the death, you know, for his own crown. Uh, Fraser also found traces of the similar customs in many parts of the world and he connected the killing of the king with the dying and the raising gods of the Mediterranean era area. So, you know, you had like Osiris, Adonis, Attis and Tammuz depending on which geographic location of the Mediterranean you're dealing with. And it all, you know, basically comes to the conclusion that at a certain stage in the evolution of, I guess, a culture, a society, it was the custom to kill the king. Hello, Swab. Hello, Soros. Hello, Mr. Gates. Either at regular intervals or when he began to grow old, now they used to kill him because his life was bound up with the fertility and prosperity of his land and his people. So therefore his withering was symbolic of the withering of the the landscape, the, the harvest, the food, the agricultural output. And if he grew old and weak, of course the crops would fail and women would fail to produce children and the world, the culture, the tribe would be barren. So in many cases, like the king of the woods, the king had to fight the challenger to, you know, prove his worth of staying. If he won, the victory showed he was still strong and virile, people were happy. If he defeated if he was defeated and killed, the challenger ruled in his place. And then in the course of time this custom was modified, the king was killed in mimicry, not in reality, through pageantry, this kind of thing. That was shown kind of in um, Shakespeare's The Mousetrap, the play within Hamlet. And this maybe on some levels Hamlet might be about that. Something rotten in the state of Denmark. So or else some kind of totemistic version of the king. So instead of the real king being sacrificed, see this happened all this all happened after Christianity came in. They were like, you know, let's find a way to get out of this. Using this this, this book of fairy tales from the Middle East. And, uh, you know, so they say, it's, well, murder is wrong. You can't kill me now. So, you know, it would have to do, you, can king a, a, you can kill an effigy of me or a totemistic substitute, compensation of me. And uh, so you would have uh, a mimic king. And like I mentioned in the Anvil of the Psyche, a real king being sacrificed. Now, this would have been a substitute 
who was chosen, enjoyed the benefits of the king for a few days or were in a certain lunar period. And then even that would include having sex with the queen and then he would and the concubines and then he would be slaughtered. And eventually the right died out altogether, leaving, you know, just the stories within customs and folklore. Now, the king who was sacrificed was a god. He was visible manifestation of the dying and the rising god, the lover of, you know, Mother Earth and the, the Earth goddess. He was the god who was in the growing crops, so which must, must die so their seeds fall into the Earth Mother, who gives birth to the risen crops, the following harvest. So that's the whole thing. You hear like the Wiccans, we are the witches, our husbands all left. Us. We are the witches, we're borderline still. We are the witches, our husbands all left us. We are the witches, and we'll lemon spell you. Okay, when they go on about, I'm a pagan because it's a religion of nature, you know, this kind of thing. Well, that's what they're, this is what they're talking about, but they don't want to talk about the grim, you know, meaty stuff like this. So, anyway, I have to stop myself from singing another chorus of that. So, you know, European mystics, alchemists, and magicians, you know, constantly looked for the spiritual death and rebirth. And the king who was killed, the god who dies, and the grain of wheat that falls to the ground, the new king, the risen god, is the reborn crop of the next season. So you can't have this sense of internal, you know, permanence. Because the society dies. And that's what's wrong today. Nobody steps down. We have rock stars who are in their 80s on stage. Prancing around like they're still 19. You have geriatrics in the World Economic Forum. Standing there on stage. And the ones taken over are their children and grandchildren. Now there's connection not limited to vegetation. As men saw the bull... Well, you know, you how many times you've been talking about that. The stag and the stallion that leads the herd must fight his younger rivals and eventually be killed and replaced by one of them in life or the herd for the herd to continue to grow and prosper. The king is dead. Long live the king, that classic thing. So, you know, that's why, you know, you have the stags fighting and stuff like that. But it's just, now, the, the reductionists, the Darwinists, the natural selectionists will say to you, oh, that's all about, you know, you know, survival of the fifth is the strongest genes. It's not really. It's about vitality. It's about vitality. And during the needle craft, who did they inject first? Now, if if that this is this 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 is how you know demons and dark sorcery run the world. Now, listen to me. If you have a family member or a friend right now, who thinks and you're saying to them. I, I really like this Thomas Sheridan fella, the way he talks about stuff and his view of the world and the way he brings mysticism and occultism and folklore and mythology into all magic and all the, all the stuff helps me to understand what we're dealing with better. And they think, oh, that Irish bastard is a gobshite. I'm not listening to him. Get him into the room and listen to this one, this next sex segment of VON and just tell him to ponder it, okay? Especially the ones who think I'm a, a conspiracy theorist. You know, uh, just a, with a tin foiler with no basis in what, what I'm trying to convey. Now listen very carefully. If the needlecraft was designed to save the human race from a deadly virus, okay? According to the Birkenhead drill... Women and children first. Who would have been the demographic who would have received this human saving elixir, the transubstantiation of the sacred needlecraft first? If they were serious about saving the human race from this deadly plague, who would have been first? The women and the children. And it would have made sense. For the same reason, it would have made sense back in the times of the Vikings or the ancient Britons or the Celts or the Anglo-Saxons or the Slavics or the Scythians or any other ancient European people to preserve the tribe going forward. Okay. So, 
who would be the last to get it? The elderly. Because if they, do, they, they, they can't produce the next generation of children and their time is nearly over, so the last thing you would do would be to save them. Following from the same concepts of this stuff I'm talking about in Fraser's book, consider what you're hearing now, my addendum to the Golden Bell. Who was the first group that they gave the needlecraft to? Over 70s. What did this tell us? Three things. One, that it wasn't designed to save the next generation of humans. Two, that if there were any adverse side effects, instant expiring deaths, etc., they could say, well, they were very old people anyway, so old people die after 70 anyway. It's not unusual. And thirdly, it was a demonic inversion of the Birkenhead drill. That thing was designed to kill us and to wipe out the human race and not to save it. Because if it had been designed to save the human race, the first round of needlecraft would have been given to the women and children and it wasn't it was given to the elderly now you folks who think I'm a tinfoil nut job you can leave the room now and go and ponder that now Fraser's you know is, is, is this 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 incredible scholarly you know perva- you know persua- pervasiveness uh, of his writing you know because constantly let people look into for divine kings, dying gods, and ritual king killings, not only in comparative mythology, but also in real life, and in religion and everything else, because the theme appeals to something deep within our human consciousness. You look at the number of poets and novelists who have made use of it, like Robert Graves, and it's a lure for modern witches and other apostles and paganism, as I was just talking about that, neo-pagans, the appeal itself is a reason for taking the theory, you know, very, very seriously. And it has a put, has this poetic, you know, assonance, po- not assonance, resonance about it, gravitas, very poetic gravitas about it. And it's not confined, you know, to just the present century. There's the, you know, Christianity when you think about it, you know. And at Fraser's time, so much of what they were reading in the Golden Bell would have made them look into the, you know, the the sacrifice and death of Jesus and all that stuff. There was a book, uh, there was this whole school that came out of a book written by a character called S.H. Hook. And it was the myth and ritual in the lab- and the labyrinth. In fact, that was where I got the, the subtitle for the labyrinth of the psychopath in my book Puzzling People from the S.H. Hook book but he cl- created a, a, a school what was basically a school or a, a movement of myth and ritual and he claimed to find all th- similar things to the, the, the Diana King of the Woods you know concept all over you know Mesopotamia Syria and Palestine and a different pattern of belief which it centered around the divine king and which was meant to ensure not only the fertility of the land, like in the in the European sense, but also the continuance, and this is very important, of government. And the myth of the dying, so the, the king, and this came probably following the post-Solomonic period, that the, and you would have had it in the Davidian kind of cults within Judaism as well, that the king doesn't only represent the natural order of the tribe but also the continuation of governmental and spiritual even bureaucratic you know continuums so the myth of the dying king it developed out of rituals which were based on you know sympathetic magic really I mean Fraser covers a lot of sympathetic magic concepts within the golden bow and the principle that m- mimicking what you want to happen like a rain dance and the you know or the the defeat of a power which is threatens peace and stability you can make it happen by creating a sympathetic compensation a, a voodoo doll being the classic you know thing of that now among the important rites in the pattern were the acting out of god of the god's death and resurrection 
you would have a ritual combat in which the god triumphed over his enemies and the forces of chaos and you know infertility and 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 sterility were defeated by the sacred marriage of the god and the mother goddess and you know how this made its way into alchemy and this would make the fields and the herds fertile in the years to come the king played the part of the god and was originally was a god in these ceremonies and may and that and it may be that the king had himself originally had to fight a real combat to undergo a real debt the patron was doubted by the authorities and the link between the divine king and the dying gods of the east is constantly been challenged and the so it's like it's been challenged because it's true i think that's one of the reasons why hook's book myth and ritual and the labyrinth was been so controversial because it was holding a mirror up to like the likes of king charles and all these like inbred royals and saying look what the hell are you here for what is your purpose why are you even in that office and that's why the, in the spiritual path you'll have someone like you know princess diana or Meghan markle come in and disrupt uh, this uh, this false kingdom this false regency uh, by a spiritual intrusion we also find it very peculiar there's weird things going on with the british royal family with kate middleton is she alive or dead and all these other kinds of things you see the thing is that the divine king or the dying god can be found in different forms it's not universal in its in its archetypes in egypt and mesopotamia it does not follow that the Egyptian and Mesopotamian religions were basically similar. They're, they're completely different. They were completely different. I mean, they don't exist now. It is, you know, it's unlikely that the kings everywhere were once killed. Not all kings were divine. And those who were, were not all divine in the same way. So the pharaoh in Egypt, well, yeah, no, we know he's a, he was an eternal god. He had similar ideas, ideas within uh, Japan, the royal family in Japan. It wasn't like that with the Mesopotamians. The Mesopotamian kings were usually, sorry, kings were usually temporary gods, who only enjoy the status of divinity while they were actually, you know, on the throne. And the king of Israel was the son of God, but was not fully a god himself for obvious reasons. And the god of the Jews did not die, or rise. The emperor of China was the son of heaven. And the chief priest of his people, this is in the Han dynasties, dynasties as the Americans say, but there was no trace of the dying god or the king killing. So you do have cultural overlaps. These were complicated beliefs and you can't really put them into a simple pattern. And that's why Fraser had 12 volumes of the Golden Bow. He was really trying to point to universal truths than to prove it, a specific point as being a hard and fast rule regarding the dying of kings and the resurrection of gods and in, in terms of fertility rights and so on. The importance of magic in the development of religion was also central to the Golden Bow and the realisation that many myths were not childish stories or immature, you know, parables to explain the world as such but were closely connected to ritual magic religion you know magic spiritual beliefs and ceremonies intended to secure what was always the primary desires and needs of man as a as a, as a being as a person what is that order within the, the the chaos of the natural world peace tranquility and plenty the quest for arcadia which I had spoken about in the last one. And speak, speaking of which, the Attis, which is who was the veneration god of Asia Minor, was do died and reborn every year, like the crops. And that cult, in typical pagan fashion, spread to Rome. And his resurrection was, you know, celebrated, or you know, massively, each year in March. Now this is this is fascinating because you get mysterious gods and entities appearing out of these these rituals, these magical traditions, these mythologies, 
these rites of the ancient sacred traditions and the connection between the king and the fertility of his land appears as I said in lots of societies in Crete the king was connected with the bull you know, the same in Ireland in many ways a symbol of procreative power as well as the strength and dominance now you hear me say on the many times that the bull is really the, the god of the Indo-European peoples and that's why the demons who are con controlling Ireland at the moment want to kill all the cattle because it's a spiritual attack by the Green Party demons infested upon our sacred bovine culture. Now in the Odyssey, Odysseus describes the perfect king who should uphold, uphold that right so that a dark soil yields its wheat and barley. The trees are laden with ripened fruit, and the sheep never fail to bring forth their lambs, nor the sea to provide its fish. All a result of his good government, and his people prosper underneath him. That's a direct quote from Odysseus. Now, a striking example of this is the Grail legends. You know, I love the Grail legends, even though they're, well, they're not really rooted in Christian things. They're, 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 they are very much surrounding and caught within the the miasma of Christian mysticism but as you see in, in the book that I co-wrote with Neil MacDonald Atlantis the the grail mysteries seem to have an origin that goes right back into say you know Celtic Irish ancient mythology such as the two of the Danon and so on now uh, you have the Fisher King in the grail legends this is a this is something that you know people have argued about forever who is you know he's the custodian of a castle where the grail is kept and he is maimed, wounded in the genitals or in the thighs, in his lower body. And because of this this injury to his reproductive organs, to his uh, sexual, you know, organs, sexual, you know, the ability, either the inability to have an erection or to perform sexual intercourse because of injuries to his lower body, the land is barren. And that's you know you know that poem by T that poem by T. S. Eliot about the wasteland, and the land will not recover till its king is healed. The blow which wounds the king comes across in Mallory's Mortha Arta, the story written around the Middle Ages in like twelve thirty, so you know late Middle Ages, mid late Middle Ages, and it's called the Su Suite of Maryland, which describes how the hero. Balalain came to the king came to the castle of the king and the king attacked him and he ran through the castle trying to find a weapon in a room richly hung he found a lance standing in a vessel of gold and silver and he seized the lance and he trust the true the Pelahan's thighs that was the king Pelahan in the castle the walls of the castle immediately fell in and outside Balalain found the people all dead the crops destroyed and the trees fallen because the king died the society died because on every single level from the natural world up from this the grains of the soil all the way up to the governance of the kingdom were rooted in the existence of the king so one of the tasks of the heroes who seeks the grail is to heal the maimed king and restore life through the wasteland and you get that in the, the T.S. Eliot poem as well now there's also the concept that of the sacred marriages. That's an interesting one too. And the sacred marriage. That's why. Why do you think the likes of when Princess Diana? Now I'm old enough to remember when that happened. That marriage, married Charles. Why that was so captivating to people, because it played on ancient archetypes of these things, of these what we're talking about here, the sacred marriages that would have existed in these ancient societies and it's the same thing with the Kennedys JFK and what was her name Jackie uh, uh, Jackie Kennedy that was very much that's what they call it didn't they call the family Camelot this shows the difference between who runs for president like you compare Biden to JFK I mean JFK once had a dinner in the Oval Office of all the greatest thinkers in America all the academics and he said something like this is the the greatest gathering of intellectuals, uh, intellectualism and brilliance in this room since Thomas Jefferson ate dinner alone. You see, this is... The, the likes of the founding fathers of the United States, like Jefferson and Washington, they themselves were god kings and very knew very much how to play that up, and Kennedy did too. 
So, you know, the, the sacred marriage thing is a big part of it as well. Uh, though not, you know, though it's not always connected with divine kings or dying gods. Or the sham fights, or they call them, the, you know, this, the sympathetic fights in English miming plays between combatants who are killed, mourned and restored to life amid general rejoicing, you know, the Punch and Judy things, and have plausibly explained the survival of ancient rituals between opposing groups who represent summer and winter, growth and decay. So when you go to Punch and Judy show, be aware that you're seeing something that goes back deep, deep, deep into Indo-European antiquity. Same with the Puck Fair in Ireland where they hoist the goat above the town in Killorn. The same thing. That's an ancient, ancient pagan ritual. In Athens itself, long after the, long after the real kings had been expelled, the wife of the chief magistrates, whose title at the time was king, went on, this is in the Christian era, through a sacred marriage every year with the ox, with the god Dion, Dionysus, and in building in a building called the Oxstall, which has formerly been a royal palace. How the rite was carried out, or whether the king himself took part, took the part of Dionysus. The thing is, no one really knows for sure. Uh, the, the ceremony's purpose, anyway, was evidently to ensure the fertility of the crops and herds of the livestock. And that went well on into the Christian, into the Christian era, uh, through the Romans and into the early Christian era, as the, as it went from the king of Athens to the magistrate of Athens. They used to have New Year festivals in Babylon too, in which the king was stripped of all his, you know, his regalia and crown, and uh, he had his ears punched by a priest which was kind of weird and it was a humiliation ritual and it was a survival of the earlier killing of the kings but it was known that the substitute kings were sometimes chosen to be beaten up by the priest and then even put to death when some great evil was believed to threaten the land so you you made a substitute king some gobshite you gave him all the, the glories of being king if the country was in danger and then they would kill him and uh and at least some occasions, the king copulated with the priestess who represented the mother goddess. A lot of the things like the in the uh, the Gnostic mass within Thelema is rooted in that. In Egypt, it's really interesting because every king of Upper and Lower Egypt is a god, uh, and by those by whose dealings one lives, the father and the mother alone by himself without equal. Each pharaoh was a was the falcon god Horus and the son Osiris, who was the god of the dead and also of both corn growing on the land, fertilized by you know the annual Nile floods. And pharaoh was Horus in life and Osiris after death. Interesting. So you had kind of like two aspects of the god, upon whom depended the fruitfulness, peace, and order of the land, the regular flooding of the Nile which was seen as a kind of like the lungs of upper Egypt breathing in and out, creating the great prosperity of that kingdom. So, he was the chief priest as well, and in theory presided over ceremonies at the, at the temples in the country. Though it was impossible for him to, pract- and to do this in practice, so local priests then became sympathetic versions of the pharaoh. So you had like almost like a, you know those Russian dolls, those nested dolls. So you had the pharaoh, and when inside that you had the priests. But all symbolically, during feast days, sympathetically becoming Horus and Osiris, in order to ensure ensure uh, the regular flooding of the Upper Nile, in order to grow the abundant harvests of ancient Egypt. There doesn't seem to be any evidence of king killing in Egypt, but the fear of the pharaoh was richly renewed at certain intervals with with sort of ceremonies, and they were called said festivals, and this was designed to rejuvenate him again, and this was also to prevent him from aging, bringing feminine, sorry, bringing from aging, so without a kind of a a feminine queen rather that the feminine aspect of this was the land of Egypt itself so this prevention of aging and fertility created a a symbolic 
copulation with the land of Egypt, including the Upper Nile, and this put an end to famine and calamity happening upon the people. And it was it, the motto was, you begin your renewal, begin to flourish again, like the infant god of the moon, you are young again year by year, and you are reborn by renewing your festival of seed, or said. There was also a thing called the Festival of Min, and there, you probably heard about this one, where the rain god fertilized the earth mother, and the pharaohs and his queen walked in procession to the harvest fields with an image of a god and a white bull. Here we go again, as the god's sacred animal. The image was enthroned in a shrine, and may be that the king and queen performed ritual sexual intercourse as the police was proclaiming hail to you men who impregnates his mother how mysterious it is which you have done here to her in the darkness and we see this in ireland too where upon the selection of the ard re the high king of ireland his first job at tara was to symbolically marry the goddess eru that was the first rite that he had to proclaim his marriage to the goddess Eru. So he was marriage, married to the land of Ireland. And this may have involved either having sex with concubines or the queen on the mound at Tara or masturbating upon it. And so but either way, he was, he was, his duty as the Ard Ri, the high king of Ireland, was to marry the goddess Eru. Just think how much better we would be off today if we had, if we still had that in Ireland. Now, some have found the divine king and the dying and the rising god at the centre of Christianity. That's you know, of course, that was going to come out, and that's all over the place. And it's you know, the Christian god, like the god of Judaism, from which Christianity sprang, was never was never a dying and rising god, really, because there's no trace in either Jewish or Christian mysticism of or religion. Of a god or king whose strength waned as the year wore on and who needed to be revived. That's what makes King Solomon so interesting. Is that when his power was necessary to be infused. he The story of the archangel Michael giving him the, 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 the ring or the sigil or the seal. In order to invoke uh, Asmodeus for the building of the temple. The... The, the Solomonic tradition, and, and which is pseudo geogra you know, pseudo mythological, pseudo historical, but still, you know, came down through the oral tradition to the Middle Ages, was that the, that Solomon used magic instead of actual partaking in these these rituals of the the living and the dying and the resurrection of the king. And and in history, this shows up when. Charles I was put to death by Cromwell at the end of the English Civil War. Uh, behind, there were stories of, like, a, that was a ritual killing. That when Charles was killed uh, at the end of the English Civil War by the, you know, by the parliamentarians, that that was very, very much, very much a, a religious, a spiritual thing. It was done for that reason. And you look at the English monarchy, whether it was the ascendancy of uh, Elizabeth I or the killing of Charles I, there were strong pseudo-mythological spiritual elements to it. And this is why I think the British royal family has captivated the imagination and the attention of humans to the degree that no other one, no other one has. And then you could even look at that as the... the the Monaco royal family and, and Grace Kelly and Grace Kelly's debt in the car crash with the daughter driving the car in Monaco and why these things so deeply affect people but of course as I mentioned earlier on with the the story of the the price we pay for great food trucks Um. We live in a world of blackness. Now, I don't mean black like in, you know, darkness. Unfortunately, things like black people have been stigmatized and people who wear black have been stigmatized. But the, it's, the blackness is really the shadow world, you know. 
you know the, the color black yeah the color of darkness and night therefore it's not unusual it's associated with death evil and the devil in the christian sense li- linked with the planet saturn we spoke about this last week you know the planet of death time sorrow and with the element of lead the dark and heavy metal of saturn the color mourning of doom and gloom black candles robes you know funerals and other equipment were used in magical ceremonies intended to kill an enemy and the method of summoning the devil is to tear a black hen in half at a crossroads at the stroke of midnight now that's still practiced a lot in particularly in you know uh, afro-caribbean cultures you go up to like spanish harlem in new york to this or in the south bronx to this day you will find blood at the crossroads of certain intersections where a, uh, a Santeria priestess or priest has uh, torn the head off a black a black uh, hen. There's also a thing within this, with the abstinence, when you kill the hen, it means you don't eat the chicken, so you have a thing called the black fast. And it's a magical method of killing a victim by you abstaining from food. So you kill the chicken, the hen, you don't eat it, you starve, and then you, the person you want to kill starts dying inside of a kind of a spiritual starvation. Very interesting, that's called the black fast. And it makes you wonder about like feeding us bugs and everything today, doesn't it? Now, you know, you hear about the, you know, black, the black mass, you know, the whole thing, like I mentioned in the, the heart red hook, these unspeakable rights of these... Uh, these swarthy races and the the black mass is essentially a magical operation that has little to do with the worship of satan that's come from movies and it's obscene blasphemous ritual offered to some demon seated upon an you know an, an altar think of like you know the 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 the, the, the devil rides out you know and you know there you have it, like the goat of mendes the devil himself it's not really that simple or that straightforward. No one really knows anything about the early history of these black masses. Now, these were rites and ceremonies that actually took place in the Christian church itself and have been recorded in early, you know, from its early antiquity until now, right in the papacy, right in the Vatican. But there's no documents that describes them firsthand because they can't be written down. But they have had witnesses, including Pope Benedict, who stepped down from the papacy after he had heard about a black mass that took place in a Vatican apartment that was installed the current Pope, pope Francis, the Pope of Woke, in power. But what we do know about these black masses that take place in Christianity is that they have ma- they are magical and they they're divorced from christianity as a theology in the 7th century church council of toledo in spain it was for instance denounced an office known as the mass of the dead it was the first recorded black mass and it was not a requiem mass in the, you know in the in the, te- in the way that we think of it the priest performed the no we're talking about a Catholic now. The priest performed the right not to deliver the soul of a dead man from purgatory, but to consign a living man to death. There was the there's also another one called the Mass the Mass of Saint Sacrier. It's a it's came from uh, Gascony and it is a priest performs a rite in a ruined and disused church. He's he has a woman whom which he would copulates and verbally the mass substantially follows the order of christian right but the priest first consecrates a black triangular shaped host and then in place of wine offers water from a well in which an unbaptized an unbaptized child has been drowned the result of this dark ceremony is the death of the victim who wastes away by inches over the coming weeks now remember these black masses are not you know, satanic prayer of violence, they are actual Christian rites. They're actually performed by, you know, by Christian Catholics. 
and gives, goes a long way to you know where the Protestant Reformation happened. Um, but early Catholicism and what I call folk Catholicism indulges the darkness just like pagan does. It's not all. It's it is light and shadow. There used to be a ceremony, I believe, in Normandy called the Mass of the Holy Ghost. And the Mass was peculiar in that it was strictly orthodox in terms of, it was a Latin Mass. But it had to be celebrated by a Franciscan friar, whose intention was on granting the dearest wish of the client who approached him, and whose behalf the Mass was actually being said. But if the motive and the intention were innocent... The results were not. So just think about that. You'd have, they'd have to go to the Mass of the Holy Ghost with to kill somebody or destroy somebody or destroy an army. They couldn't go there to help somebody. And there's a story in Normandy itself in Norman, Norman folklore, Normandy folklore, not Norman like in the Normans, in Normandy folklore, of a young girl who was induced by a Franciscan monk to say this Mass to ensure the immediate return of her lover who was abroad in pursuit of fortune. The result was an impulse so urgent that he abandoned all his plans for the future and he immediately sailed back, sailed back to her in France. He was overjoyed to find a girl waiting to welcome him on the quay, but just as they were about to reunite, the cliff beneath which the girl stood subsided and killed her and crushed her and buried her instantly. So that's the kind of, you know, the, karm- the karmic aspects of these and that's they, these were black masses, and they're nothing at all like the concept of the black mass where you see witches and the, the witches Sabbath and Satan that you see like in brought to us true like, you know Dennis Wheatley and that kind of thing in the modern sense. In the in in France in the thirteen hundreds there was an inquisitor who was called Pierre Gui, and two vicar generals of the Archbishop of Toulouse. And they tried over 50 people on charges of witchcraft and sorcery. And I was re- I discovered this story when I was working on the Pendle Witches thing. And among them was a girl called Anne-Marie. And she told the judges that a man clothed in animal skins had visited her when she was washing her laundry. She consented to sexual intercourse. Afterwards, he breathed on her and she was transported to the Sabbath where she was received by a goat who thought her all manner of evil practices. Now these practices included a mass offered by one dressed as a priest. Now they were questioning about her beliefs. The inquisitors asked Anne-Marie and she told them there were two gods. There was the Lord of Heaven and the Lord of the World. And there was a war between them. It was her opinion that the Lord of the World would be victorious. Now this later made its way into theosophy and Luciferian theosophy. So, uh, you know, Alice Bailey and all this kind of thing, the Lucifer Society and Lucifer, that the belief that it, within esoteric... Now, I'm not talking about the Lucifer that I venerate, the pagan Greco-Roman god. I'm talking about the esoteric Lucifer. And the esoteric Lucifer is considered the god of this world or the lord of this world. Now, it's, you know, you you can take away the supernatural elements of counts like this can say... You know, we're still left with a fact that this happened, but the girl was disturbed, and that the devil was a, actually a human being who seduced her, and the goat was a man wearing a headdress, and who was the leader of this crowd who were just trying to get laid, and the pact with Satan was an acceptance of the candidate of the assembly and a sexual ceremony, blah, 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 blah. And you could tie that in with paganism and the whole thing of Baphomet and going back forward to the Pan, and uh, Dionysian cults and Bacchus cults, but the devil in the witch's sabbath was the equivalent of a priest and these accounts of these witch's sabbaths they're they're very different uh, and they're not always the same water replaced wine in the chalice and sometimes a turnip jack-o'-lantern you know that's where the jack-o'-lantern came from a turnip uh, was left black with rot and was used instead of the, the the holy communion the host and in the 17th century witch hunter it was a guy called pierre the Lancre reported that he used an old black boot at the elevation in place of a turnip. 
And this is why you often find an old shoe or an old boot in which in old houses where witchcraft has been has been practiced in the rafters. Remember I was saying the other week about the other Vaughan about well, if your house has been used in witchcraft in the past, rebuild it because there's either going to be a, a sheep's bone, or babies are an adult shoe, or some kind of sigil marked in some of the the woodwork, and that's what's keeping the the magical sort of like after effect fallout going. Now, along with the black mass. There's also a thing called the heretical mass. And this is like dualist theology, a belief a belief that the two great forces of good and evil, black and white magic, are two aspects of the same thing. So dualism, right? Now the black and white stands for complementary op- opposites, which by their interaction serve as the, the source of creative energy. The concept of the opposites is the theme of every kind of magical operation, really, when you think about it. And there's the, you know, the stories of the Black Mass that was said at the for Catherine de Medici, the Queen of France, and a priest consecrated a black and white host, and the white host being given to a young boy whose throat was cut to provide human blood for the chalice. A similar concept inspires that the saying of prayers backwards. So, you know... It's it's not demonic for the sake of being evil. There was a belief that was probably rooted in Neoplatonism that came out of Gnostic and Catharic thought that uh, the Christian mass had to be equally supplemented by a black mass. Otherwise, the power force, the charge, would have been inert. It would have produced no charge. And this may be the reason why you have black masses said within the Vatican to this day. Because the basic mass itself is not producing a charge because it does not have a shadow equivalent to the light. The malediction and the belediction. That that those fingers, that shape that the, the Pope makes that casts the shadow of a demon on the wall. The malediction and the benediction. And around the you know around the same time in the fifteen hundreds, women were tried concerning associations with demons and association with witches. And we, on the Sabbath, the usual thing, blah blah blah. We all know about it. And one woman admitted that a demon had taken the place in her husband's bed, and so that she could slip away to be present at the assembly. And she said to serve the supper, which was apparently the cathartic equivalent of a mass. It was called the Cathari Supper. This was like a reenactment of the Last Supper instead of the host. And you know, the Cathars, which I spoke about them, they were a, you know, a, a heretical uh, danger to the papacy and they believed all material things were a creation of an evil spirit. It was very, very Gnostic. You uh, simulation theory idiots out there would love that. As they therefore rejected the sacramental systems of you know the papacy and the church and the mass and the Latin Mass, and the Mass became, they believed matter, being evil, all matter, like this this whole reality that we live in of matter as being evil. So they rejected those sacraments within them. And we know a fair bit about the Cathars, but a lot is missing, and especially we don't know a lot about the Supper. But it's evidence that it was a close relation to ceremonies that were performed by men dressed as priests. And it's 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 not surprising the Inquisition took an unsympathetic view of the witches as allies of the cathartic sect, which secretly preached that the Christian mar- mass was an offering to Satan. Satan, I don't think of a being or a devil. Satan means the opposing force. So when they were saying that the Catholic mass was was really a veneration of Satan, that in secrecy, well, so while the parishioners were going to mass. And saying mass in a Catholic church. And being told it was all love and light and God and all this stuff and the Holy Spirit. What they were not being told is that within the bishop's palace. Within the seminaries. Within the convents. And within the papacy itself. A black mass was being secretly said. That was being kept secret from uh, the laity. Now, there are other reasons the 
you know, for the Inquisition's severity against the Cathars, and that was they were allied with not with them were not primary theologians or reformers. The mass of the black turnip and the boot suggested not only a religious but a social protest amid the foundations of medieval societies. The Cathars wanted to set up a new order in society of the reformed cathartic model and they were you know they were really revolutionaries in many ways and that's dangerous shit to kings and stuff like that and a sense this is why they invited you know the cabalists into places like Ale laban where myself and neil begin the story of uh, the, uh, the 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 renish our version of the renish chateau tales and they they were this was an, it was a new spiritual as well as social order the two were completely interlinked and it may the sad thing about it is it may have reformed the gnostic aspects it may have reformed or what's the word not validated but you know completed their gnostic inheritance of fatalism and a reformed cathartic Christianity within Europe would have been a far better thing than what we got now if this is what happens I'm I'm just I'm being sp- speculative here I'm not you know saying it would have definitely happened I'm certainly not a Cathar fanboy but you know the the, the great tragedies we'll just never know and um, there was also this thing called the altar of flesh is another weird thing and in the, the in the Reformation medieval period, when you know when that civilization collapsed, uh, witchcraft and magic just didn't. It just flourished. That's one of the things about the Reformation. Which I mean, look at the 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 the, the events at Ludron in France and that, that movie, as shown that movie, The Devils. You know, it just it just flourished. The as you know, the French society was falling apart. And the Huguenots were taken over and burning down Catholic churches and nunneries and everything else. Uh, the nuns at Ludron, at the um, the Ursuline convent, devoted themselves to the uh, the veneration of none other than who? Our friend Asmodeus. Not too far from Rennes Chateau either. Anyway, uh, the... Uh, the, the witches of the Black Mass were accustomed to use the Orthodox mask and a magic charm to win back wayward lovers and stuff like that. So witchcraft in the time of the Reformation replaced Christianity for a while. And uh, when well, the Christians were all murdering each other over which version of the King James Bible or canon law was correct, you know, versions of a Jewish holy book, the there was another world of the cunning folk who came up from the not only the rural regions but also in the cities as well it was very big who brought you know m- witchcraft and magic from the old pagan world back into people's lives as a way for them to deal with the society collapsing around them which is probably like what we're doing today and you have things like you know the VOM and me as western civilization is collapsing I'm probably providing that purpose here where it's like you know you don't have to go down with this shite there is another way you can psychically escape from it and the most famous person involved in all this was the beautiful Marquis de Montespan and she employed a priest to say masses which include a prayer that the queen may be barren that the king leave her bed and board for me and she duly you know in time became the mistress of King Louis the 14th in 1673 and uh, when she feared that she might be supplanted by a rival, she and a pre two priests and a a strange character called Ginsburg, a- Abbe Ginsburg, Father Ginsburg, said three masses over her naked body, and the blood of a sacrificed child was used for the wine and mixed with flour to make the host. An incantation was recited calling on Asatot and who else again? Our old friend Asmodeus, the princes of anonymity, to ensure that the king would refuse nothing that the Montespan asked of him. Now, black magic and these kinds of things associated, they do still survive and are said to be on the increase in, you know, kind of like obscure satanic, they call them groups, Order of the Nine Angels and so on. And there's, there's also some very dark 
one very, very dark and dangerous group that operates on the English-Welsh borders in places around there. In that they're, they're involved in some really nasty, dark stuff. And uh, I'm not even going to talk about them because I don't want them coming after me. But uh, during revolutionary periods, just like now, I guess, where it's revolutionary, not in the sense of, you know, we're being destroyed by AI rather than like an actual revolutionary political movement. It always gives rise to occultism. So I'm not going to say that's what I'm talking about. Like that's what, you know, VON probably is. And, in, you know, since World War One, you know, right or left political systems, all, you know, from the from both the the Nazis and the Bolsheviks all showed, you know, an interest in black magic and the occultism. And we know, you know, we've all read about that. And the ceremonies of the Hitler Youth directly resembled that of the Catholic Gnostic, the Catholic Orthodox Mass. On purpose, I might add. And there's a reason for this, is that in the when the National Socialists took over, one of the first groups they attacked was Catholic Apprentice Boys. There was a, a Catholic Apprentice Boys march that used to take place in, in Munich. And the, when the National Socialists took part, they they sent the brown shirts just before they were all eliminated to go down and have, you know, these freebooter things. They were given free boots to beat up the Catholic apprentice boys. And Hitler, being who he was, said, no, we need these people on our side. So the Catholic apprentice boys of Munich and Bavaria became the Hitler Youth. And how they did it was they gave them the rights of the Catholic Orthodox Mass. Amazing stuff, isn't it, when you really think about it? There was this leads on to enormous subjects to do with like blood ritual, uh, Blavatsky secret doctrine, and other things, and even that Christian mysticism with William Blake. And I would, you know, I'll save them for future Vaughns because they will take up hours of the stuff even by themselves. But returning to an, an argument I had online this week regarding that Christianity has done nothing good for. Europe. One of the slurs that that Christian fanatics, particularly Presbyterians, use to besmirch the name of European pagans is they always say they were backward and they were they were animals and stuff. But and then Christianity civilized them. No, no, no. Christianity was civilized by Roman and Greek culture and civilization, and then you brought that to the to the to the you know the Celtic, Nordic, and Slavic people. You you didn't give it all to everybody. You you usurped it and then said it was your own. But there's a common thing: the the boar and the pig is was a sacred animal in terms of a food source to all these tribes, and they would always refer to them as pigs, obsessed with pigs. You know, they were run. The Germanic people were running around with chasing pigs in the in the Teutonic forests until the Christians came along and civilized them. Now, this is, again, we know what this is about. And this is, I, wa I wanted to talk about this for a while, but I'll get my notes up here. And this, a lot of these notes are stuff that go in future books and I just haven't had time to write anything down. So that's why you're getting them on the Vaughn. It really comes from, you know, you read my book, the, the Druid Code, and I spoke about the black pig and all that stuff. The symbolism of the pig and the boar is so deeply, you know, ingrained right across the Indo-European world that that's why the Christians compared pagans to pigs. To you know, they were they were pigs. We were the same as them because we didn't only eat them and hunt them as boar, but we also venerated them to a certain extent because of their physical attributes, especially the boar. So now I'll just finish up by talking about the boar. And and a reason why I'm talking about this, I was reading, the bo people have been releasing wild, mostly hunters have been releasing wild boar back into the Irish landscape. So we're only missing one, two of our traditional native animals. The, the ones left to come back are the, the beaver, and the wolf but the boar has been released into Ireland and these so called ecologists have been trying to shoot them and kill them all it's disgusting really and they say oh Ireland's not the same Ireland it was back then yeah your yeah, Christians destroyed the motherfuckers and you know th these animals are, are power spirit animals of the Celtic people 
But the, the power and the fury of these sovereign beasts is what was the appeal of the boar. And, you know, and that's why it had created all this archetypal symbolism and mythology from the, you know, from the Nordic world, the Viking world, all the way to southern, you know, southern India, to Sri Lanka. And you, the amount of folklore is unbelievable. And, you know, there was even a, pagan, a Christian carol called the Boar's Head Carol that was sung at Christmas and it came from the Yule Festival and that's the Noel one. That's what that is. You know the Noel, Noel. A boar is a sovereign beast, and acceptable in every feast. So might this Lord be to most the least. Noel, Noel, the boar's head we bring in song. In worship him, of him does sprang. Out of virgin to redress all wrong. Noel, Noel. So when you're singing Noel, Noel, that's coming from a pagan Yule hymn devoted to uh, the, the the light and the darkness by the nobility of the boar. And that's why the Christians still to this day say that the pagans only ever hunted, ran around chasing pigs. From antiquity, and this is why also why the, the Semitics hate the pig as well. Now, because they did, they couldn't herd it and they, you know, they couldn't, uh, so they, they, they made it unclean. You know, this wasn't unclean. The boar and the pig is the the swine is a sacred beast in our, to our people. Now, from antiquity to the Middle Ages and later, the boar was the first of all symbols of the fertility of the earth. And again, back to Germany and from the Teutonic tribes up until the Middle Ages, uh, the boar is rushing through the corn and the children were warned, don't go through the corn, there's a boar in there. The last sheep of the harvest sometimes is called the sow. And that's where the whole thing of sowing corn comes from. Sowing crops. It's, it, there's a, a symbolic relationship between the sow of the boar and the sowing of the crops. S-O-W. And they were saved and from this was made a loaf in the form the shape of a boar. Often a boar's head. And this was placed on the Yule table until the end of the festive season. It was then kept until the spring sowing when part of it would be eaten and the, this it would have been made of a, a, a grain like pumpernickel which would have been really strong would be eaten and a mixed part would seed corn to ensure a healthy crop a comparison is drawn of course with the Scandinavian Yule custom of drinking and eating to a good agricultural year and peace and that's where we come, our, our Yule Christmas feasts come from now the art, this idea of sacrificing in the dead of winter to the fertility deities, deities was not far off but there was little direct evidence on the point because the boar was a sacred animal of the fertility god Freyr in the Scandinavian mythology within the Eddas we're told how Freyr rode to Baldur's funeral behind the boar uh, the, with the golden bristles also known as the one with the terrible tusks and another boar is mentioned in the literature of the source of the Scandinavian mythology and it's called the Samashiri Say sorry, say Hamirian, uh, the boar which killed and has eaten the f- fresh every day by the heroes of Antala. You know you've all heard that story. The fertility and death. The boar was thus not connected in the mythology of many peoples with the symbolism of death and the dead. So in northern, so it was sorry also connected with that so in europe and scandinavia the boar represented the souls of the departed and was believed to run on the storm clouds as part of odin's wild hunt here we can recognize the curious you know relationship between fertility and destruction that these characteristics are shown in many early pagan mythologies the roman historian tacticus and he said that the tribes of northern northeastern germany worshiped the mother of the gods the boar and this is where they, this is why they call the pagans called the germanic uh, christians pig chasers they wear an emblem of their cult and it's the mask of the boars which stand as armor or human protection and ensure the safety of the worshiper so they have a kind of a talismanic aspect to them and this is a uh, this jewel of life and death aspects of the mother goddess are related to fertility deus is all you know it's well known it's everywhere the wearing of armor especially a helmet shaped from the form of a boar's head or ornaments with a boar's tusk is 
all over the Mediterranean, the Mycenaeans in Greece especially, uh, the position of the boar in Greek mythology and its connection with the gods in, you know, things like the Iliad, you know, the boar hunt in the Iliad. And European mythology finds in recent times there was the boar head helmet found at Sutton Hoo in Suffolk and, you know, just before World War Two, And this object, which I've seen in the British Museum, it's unbelievable. Is ornamentation was probably, you know, a magical, a magical, it wasn't, it could not have been used in battle. So it was a magical device. And the boar symbols was emblazoned on the shields and standards all over Christian Europe and used the boar emblem, the sanglier in European heraldry, can be traced right back to the earliest uh, herald, her, heraldic artwork. Of course, Richard III was the most famous wearer of this. Now, within the Semitic, and you see, here we go again. So, I just spoke about how the pig is considered unclean in the Semitic world. Now, in the in the boar, in that part of the world, the boars is the embodiment of evil. These Semitic peoples have always regarded the pig as unclean and are refused to have anything to do with it. This is probably because it was originally a, a sacred animal uh, to the Jews and who were worshipped uh, until uh, by the pagan kings of Gehenna and then later abominated it. And these people refused to eat pork and that's not just only the Jews, it also was among the Syrians, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, and in modern time we know that about the Jews and the Muslims. Now, legends of gods slain by boars are while boar hunting, they're all over the place. Adonis, uh, it was the consort of Aphrodite and Atis, and uh, the consort of Sybil both met their end in this way, and the same is the true of the Egyptian god Osiris, although the evidence here is scantily you know, handed to us from antiquity. But I, I think it mentions in the Golden Bell that Osiris was killed by a boar. But I thought was I remember that was like one of the first criticisms I read of the Golden Bell, that they said that that was one of the things that Fraser got wrong. Now, the Cretans of Crete in ancient Greece, you know, they believe that Zeus himself was a prince ripped up by a wild boar and buried in their midst. And then he is supposed to have earned the reputation as... Of them and their tradition, reputa- their own traditional reputation as liars and spoofers, and the boar came to be the incarnation of the enemy of the gods in Egypt. For example, the evil god Set uh, was was often shown in kind of boar pig like form, and then you had the conception of the West that we find in the traditions of Odin's the wild hunt and the story of King Arthur who did the boar hunt. I mean, you know, they, they all came the same thing anyway. In which the fabulous boar is the emissary of who? Which was Satan. Who was? Odin. Odin Satan, as Barry Jumo would say. To be overcome not by force, but by what? By prayer. Now, the old thing, the old Christians, be a weak man, get down and pray and ask for forgiveness. Now, don't struggle to, for greatness. Now, comparative accounts of boar hunts are found in many medieval texts. Among them, the French Song of Roland, and there's the Nor- Anglo Norman stories, and the romance of. You know the Germanic and the French Franco romances, and all the way over in India, there is a volume of material, not as you know as massive as in Europe, but plenty of it regarding the boars. The god Vishnu was once a boar, was on a boar, sorry. Uh, while the Indian creation legend tells how the god Brahman, in the form of a boar, lifted up the earth on his back from the waters of the primeval flood. That being the power and strength of the boar. The power and this potency of this animal, this sacred animal, was believed in many parts of the world to be the source of magical assistance. Boar's tusks and hooves were used as amulets, uh, while the infusion of the boar's tusk could help cure all manners of diseases and ailments, especially things like epilepsies and anything to do with the neuro- neurological system and the central nervous system that cause twitches and things like that, or palsy. Belief that the, the power and the, the strength of the boar, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, tenacity would help restore your nervous system. So that that's my rebuttal to the person who on Facebook this week said that um, until Christianity 
the pagans of Germanic Europe were nothing but, you know, savages running around after pigs in the woods. And that's where that all came from and why you have been coached uh, by your rabbis to believe it. So I'm going to finish up now. This is uh, another VON. The next week, I think there's a hocus focus with Sarah, so there won't be a VON. There'll be a VON after that. And uh, we will continue this meditation, this discussion of using mythology and you know things like the gold you can actually buy smaller versions like compendiums of the golden bow you don't have to buy the full 12 volumes but uh, so many things i've mentioned over the years have been greatly inspired by fraser's the golden bow even during the rona and we're back to that again you remember me saying that like the red robin we need to red robin our leaders and i believe that you know the red robin being the the slitting of the throats of their throats and hauling their carcasses around the fields so that their blood may fertilize the crops and uh, I use that as a metaphor and a loose metaphor as such that seemed to have struck a lot of people even many Christians who were listening to my Rowan Ironicles and this is why I do this folks and this is why it's so we you know this is what keeps me going what keeps me going is knowing that the shit that we have today and we're dealing with our ancestors have dealt with it in a different force you know the demon world is just appearing as ai now in its new form the, the, the dark forces and we we have to understand that that for every black mass that's set at davos we have to say a white mass in our own in our own lives and that we have to practice the the sympathetic magic that will bring them down you know like i often think of the concept of a needle craft of pagan revival i guess that's what i've been up to anyway to offset their needle craft of extermination and i want you to think closely about the concept of the why they went after the elderly first and not the women and children because they knew this was genocide they, this, they knew this is what they wanted and there was no point they and they, they they needed a specimen that would be that would drop dead it wouldn't be a problem there are also demons within the our side who were some of the most hysterical uh types who said that one single needle craft will kill everybody and what that was designed to do was to make our side say even one shot will kill you knowing that it was the it would be the the foghorn leghorn that would do it in so that would say people like you say go you said that the first one would kill everyone well you, you're full of shit because everyone who got the first one and they're all still alive and that was to make them go out to the second one and you look like a fool this is why you cannot be impulsive this is why you must always put the brakes on and think what's really going on here and who really is my friend and enemy and you will find in no time if you invoke the the the, the occultism the esotericism the mis, mis, the mythology of the past and bring it to life as magic in your own lives that you will find your charisma growing to a point where you can offset anything and no matter what they will throw at you poison you pollute you with try to put you into pits of despondency you'll look at them and you'll say feck them if they can't take a joke sanguine gnosis till next time my friends <laughs>